to class 21, uh, in which we're going to be discussing the questions of personal responsibility for climate change. So let's go ahead and jump into today's lecture. So today we're going to be focusing on a couple of things. We're going to look at the uh, limits of traditional conceptions of responsibility when we're talking about climate change, and also describe the role of what Jameson calls, calls value systems and how we need to not just simply be thinking about ways to use our current value systems to address climate change, but to transform the way we think about things like responsibility itself. So I'm going to start by thinking a little bit about what responsibility is itself. So all the principles that we talked about last class, the polluter pays principle, the beneficiary pays principle, the ability to pay principle, the guaranteed minimum principle, the equal burdens principles, all of these are different ways of allocating responsibility according to different conceptions of fairness. Now the question that our readings from Jameson and Senate Armstrong take up today is whether or not these principles actually provide moral reasons for me as an individual or you as an individual to take action. All of these principles presuppose that we've already believed that we have some moral responsibility and this is how we should distribute or allocate that responsibility. So what we're going to be talking about today is, is do I as an individual have to do, take specific actions? Are individuals personally responsible for climate change? So to talk about this, we need to talk about what responsibility is. So usually we start working backwards from some harm or some effect, something that happens in the world and try to, and we ask the question, well, who is responsible? The first uh, idea is that we need to have some sort of responsible cause. Someone has to have done something to bring about that effect. There has to be some cause for this effect through some action. And that's the kind of first thing of responsibility. But this isn't really enough to ascribe responsibility. Instead, we also want to suggest that without this action, that the effect would not have happened, right? That if the person or thing had not occurred, right, this negative harm that we're talking about would not occur. So without this action here, there would not be this harm here, that the world without this action would look very differently. We also want to say that this agent, in order to ascribe responsibility that's not just simply a causal story, has to have some control over their actions, that this agent could have done something else, which would have made the world look differently. They could have done nothing but that there was some alternative possibilities available to that agent when they were acting, such that they are, are, direct, are not just causally, but morally responsible. And most controversially, this also tends to ascribe responsibility to some sort of intention, that people intended to act in the way that they did. And this intention of acting is usually what then leads to an ascription of moral responsibility, that you can be held blameworthy, uh, that you can be held at fault for this action. So this conception of responsibility really boils down to uh, three key things. First, that the responsible agent is an individual uh, or even or a single corporate entity like a country or a business. And this is saying that there is a single agent that needs to be held responsible that there's a clear causal connection between the harm and the responsible agent. The harm would not have happened without the agent's action. And finally, that the agent has some sort of control over their action, that they could have behaved differently, that they weren't forced in order to do so. So the question for us is how, much, how well does this um, system hold up? And in many of our uh, ordinary situations, this holds up pretty well. Um, consider uh, using the same kind of imagined scenario that Dale Jameson does in, in our reading for today. Um, we can think of uh, Nat Nat Natalia Smith uh, owns this house. Albert Jones comes in, breaks a window, steals her TV, and absconds with it. Um, and here we can see, uh, Jameson writes on page 83 of your reason, reading that Smith suffers a clear harm. She is made worse off by having lost the television set, 
Jones is responsible for Smith's loss, for she was the cause of the harm, and no one else was involved. So we have a very clear cause and effect. And so Jameson himself concludes that what we have is a clear, self-contained story about Smith's loss. We know how to identify the harms and how to assign responsibility. We may respond to this breach of our norms by punishing Jones or requiring some compensation from Jones. So this is our kind of basic intuition, and it's pretty common across all sorts of different uh, questions from liberal political theory, uh, the idea that we, the individuals are the primary uh, units of society, uh, to our kind of financial system in which individuals are responsible for paying their debts, uh, to our legal system where individuals can be held criminally or civilly liable for their actions or their negligence. Uh, and the basic idea is summarized in uh, the piece that we actually read from Iris Marion Young a few weeks ago, that we assign responsibility to a particular agent whose actions can be shown to be causally connected to the circumstances for which responsibility is sought. And this holds for most of our ordinary situations. Something bad happens, we want to assign some sort of blame and compensation to the person who did the bad thing. However, climate change challenges this description of responsibility in a few important ways, and we're going to focus on three. First, that innocent acts can have devastating consequences. The everyday behavior, whether it's driving to work, whether it's you literally tuning into this lecture, our response are ain't going to have be linked to increased amounts of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And these are often not only legal actions, but they often have good and well-meaning altruistic aims. And this kind of, and this undermines the control provision because we're often acting without intending to cause environmental harms. So should we be held accountable for the unintended and accidental side effects of otherwise legal and moral behavior? And we do have some um, legal, con legal uh, concepts for uh, holding people accountable for negligent behavior. If you're familiar with the idea of strict liability, and, and if you've taken some more law classes, you might be familiar with this idea. But for the most part, we don't hold people accountable for like the, the second order effects of their behavior. And climate change is really, like, really all about these types of uh, second order effects or negative externalities. The second reason that Jameson discusses is that the causes and the harms may be diffuse. The climate change is a complex global problem that is caused by multiple people and where no one person's individual emissions are, are directly responsible for climate change, right? There's no way that me alone is going to tip us over the edge in my personal emissions. There's no one single cause that we can isolate, but also the climate change is not a, simply an additive process uh, where we simply could add up everyone's emissions and divide them up. Um, because the Earth is a complex system, so we have to think about how these different uh, issues are interacting with each other, how these different uh, decision, how these different um, systems, behaviors, consumption patterns are interacting with each other, meaning that anyone's contribution is both negligible and deeply mediated by the institutions that they inhabit. Right? If you um, are, a, if you are, have to drive to work and you can't afford a Tesla, that's going to be it. A different, you're going to have a different carbon footprint than if you don't have to, right? So these interacting process, population changing, land use practices, energy use, natural systems, and feedback effects are all going to undermine the clear causal connection provision, right? It's not always clear who is who's doing the bad thing. And finally, Jameson argues that the causes and harms are remote in time and space. And greenhouse gases linger in the atmosphere for a long time, decades if not centuries. Um, so, for example, if you go on a Sunday drive, as Walter Ensign Armstrong uses in his example and you're reading, you could be releasing unnecessary emissions into the atmosphere that could contribute to a typhoon on the other side of the world much decades later. So our normal everyday behavior could lead to devastating consequences. Um, and the challenge here is many, one of, one of the challenges is that many of our guilty agents will be long dead before the effects are actually felt. So how are we supposed to ascribe uh, responsibility to a single agent who is clearly causally connected to the challenge? And so we are faced with this dilemma that Jameson helpfully summarizes on page 84 of your reading, that despite the fact that serious, clearly identifiable harms will have occurred because of human agency, conventional morality would have trouble finding anyone to blame. No one intended the bad outcome or brought it about or was even able to foresee it. 
Today we face the possibility that the global environment may be destroyed, yet no one will be responsible. And this is a kind of, this should give you pause. This should be a kind of overwhelming and maybe even terrifying thought provision that ultimately it's much harder to ascribe responsibility in cases like climate change than we are used to. So the challenge then is to think through ways that we can actually think through this. But before we turn to the Senate Armstrong article um, and, and Jameson's own response to this dilemma, this is a good time if you need to t pause this lecture, take a break, uh, run some errands, do whatever you need to do, and then come back to this the second half of this lecture. So picking back up here, we might think but what if we're thinking about our future obligations? Sure, we might not be able to assign perfectly causal responsibility for the past, right? Maybe the polluter pays principle or the beneficiary pays principle are out of the question. But surely don't I have an individual obligation to not make climate change worse in the future? And Walter Sennett Armstrong in your, in your read, assigned reading, other assigned piece for today, actually says that we need to test our moral intuitions, that this is a complicated and controversial case, and we can't just rely on our normal moral intuitions, but we actually need to make sure that we are making the right decision. So we ask the question of, do we have an individual obligation not to go for a Sunday joyride, not to just drive around our car just for fun and relaxation and enjoyment on a Sunday afternoon? And he surveys all the moral principles that he can think of, but I'm going to focus on just a few of them. The first is the harm principle. This is kind of the basic idea that individuals should be responsible for the harm they cause. But this doesn't seem to work because no direct harm is necessarily caused by my joyride, right? There's no way that me driving around on a Sunday afternoon is directly causing human suffering. It might be indirectly contributing to conditions that will lead to human suffering, but there's not a direct cause. Maybe we think that we should focus on risks, right? that the individual should take responsibility for the risks that he, they take. And this is kind of Henry Hsu's argument that we talked about uh, a few weeks ago, that we should be cautious and alleviate risk. But Senator Armstrong says that all behavior risks the effect of climate change. So for this would be too strong of a principle, that we would literally have to shut down every single aspect of our global economy and society, make basically all of human life impossible. So maybe we think that we should adopt uh, a virtue principle, some sort of thinking back to Sandel and thinking about a what would a virtuous response to climate change look like? And here the Senator Armstrong says that, uh, well, it's not clear that there's a vice happening or that there's unvirtuous activity, that as long as you are um, enjoy and participating in safe and relatively harmless behavior, that there's not a clear vice. Maybe we think that we should describe a principle of collective responsibility, that individuals should be held responsible for the group. But most theories of collective responsibility ascribe to a, an intentional or participatory group, that you have to have intentionally joined that group in order to be held responsible for the outcomes of that group. So it's not simply the fact that like lots of different people are also driving their cars. So we're, we're this is the way that Senate Armstrong concludes the reading on page 343 that this conclusion will upset many environmentalists. They think that they know what wasteful driving is immoral. They want to be able to condemn those who drive gas guzzlers just for fun on a Sunday afternoon. My conclusion should not be so disappointing. Even if individuals have no such moral obligations, it is still morally better or morally ideal of individuals not to waste gas. We can and should praise those who save fuel. All of these reactions are available, even if we cannot truthfully say that driving violates a moral obligation. So all we can really say is that this case is really more complicated and we can't uh, ascribe a kind of negative principle of responsibility and hold people to blame or at fault, but we can praise people for conserving. So this is probably going to raise the obvious question of what should we do if we, if, if we don't have good principles to hold in individuals accountable. Well, Senator Armstrong argues that we should hold governments accountable, that governments still have moral obligations to fight global warming because they actually can make a difference. Because uh, individuals can't causally bring about or fix climate change, but government action might be able to. And therefore, governments should take the laws that would um, limit people's driving on a Sunday afternoon, not by imposing a moral penalty, but by a legal one. Um, but 
there's a couple of reasons why we might not find this a satisfying response. Um, where, why, if there's no in moral obligation for individuals, why would we ascribe that moral obligation to governments using the same logic? Um, how are we going to motivate governments to do that without individuals taking moral responsibility? So this is a pretty depressing conclusion. Um, we don't have any good way to assign individual responsibility for climate change based on our existing moral principles. But Jameson believes that there is hope for us. Um, that we, and he says that we should focus more on character and less on calculating probable outcomes. That if we focus simply on like what, am, what is my behavior likely to bring about, that we, it makes us, he calls, cynical calculators and it institutionalizes hypocrisy. We can each reason that since my contribution is small, outcomes are likely to be determined by the behavior of others. Reasoning in this way, we can justify driving cars while advocating bicycles or using fireplaces while favoring regulations against them. That when we focus on just calculating outcomes, we end up becoming cynical and we just say, oh, well, it's not my fault, so I can do whatever I want. Instead, he says that we should focus on the level of character. Uh, what type of person, what kind of actions, what kind of uh, virtues he, uh, do I want to be known for? And, the, and they cultivate a different set of values and ethics and dispositions and characteristics that lead us to value uh, a more sustainable, more simpler lifestyle, regardless of its causal outcome on climate change. And he argues that unless we develop new values and conceptions of responsibility, we're never going to be able to motivate people to respond to climate change. So this involves uh, thinking about human values not as natural or universal, but as evolving over time, that they, we can, they can be changed, um, and understanding the roles that values and uh, virtues and ideals and principles have on affecting, informing and affecting our social institutions. And ultimately, this requires dialogue and discussion. It can't be something that we accomplish by ourselves, but requires that we engage with others. So if there is a meaningful change that makes a difference over the long term, he, he writes on page 85, it must be both collective and thoroughgoing, developing a deeper understanding of who we are, as well as how our best conceptions of ourselves can guide change is a fundamental issue we face. That it's not for, for Jameson about setting the proper price on carbon, but it's about determining what we as individuals and we as a society want to value. And we have to start there first or we're never going to actually make the policy changes necessary to effectively and justly respond to climate change. So next class, we're going to think less about moral responsibility and thinking about political responsibility. Um, we're going to read a piece from Simon Caney argues that we need to bridge together a bunch of different political principles uh, to ascribe responsibility. And then a piece by Robin Eckersley, who turns to Iris Marion Young's theory of the social connections model to think about uh, responsibility for climate change. So for the discussion post for today, uh, based on Jameson's and Senate Armstrong's arguments, uh, do you believe that you have an individual responsibility to take actions to limit your own carbon footprint? Why or why not? If you don't, who does, if anyone? Again, if you have an even number ID, student ID, you're, you're responsible for writing a 200 word response based on the reading um, by midnight on March 25th. If you have an odd number of ID, then you're responsible for giving a short 100 word reply to a peer's post by midnight uh, on March 26th. So thank you for tuning in to this lecture. Uh, again, feel free to join the discussion section, send me an email, uh, let me know both if, the, if this format is working for you, if it's helpful, um, and any questions you have about the material. Uh, take care. I'll see you next time.